Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dr. Craig Willis, Professor with the Department of Biology at the University of Winnipeg, will be speaking about understanding and managing white nose syndrome in North American bats. Every month, PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in the Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. Don't miss our upcoming native prairie speaker series. On June 10th, Dr. Christopher M. Summers, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Regina, will be talking about reptiles on the fringe, movement, habitat, and population genetic structure of northern snakes, and that's June 10th at noon. On June 20th, James Page, Species at Risk and Biodiversity Specialist with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, will be presenting a webinar called Help the Bats, Citizen Science and Bat Conservation. That's June 20th at noon. Both of these webinars are free and you can watch from any location. Just register through our website. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Canada North Environmental Services, Crescent Point Energy, SAS Power, Sask Energy, Trans Canada Corporation, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our supporting sponsor is Eco-Friendly SAS, as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. In-kind support for today's webinar has been given by the University of Winnipeg. A reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. Now, a bit about today's presenter. Dr. Craig Willis joined the University of Winnipeg in 2006 and he was the university's first chancellor's research chair from 2011 to 2014, and is currently a professor of biology. He and his students work on the ecology, physiology, and conservation of small wild mammals, especially bats, and have been contributing to white nose syndrome research since the disease was discovered in 2007. Their work has been important for understanding the origin and physiological effects of WNS and for understanding how we might protect bat populations from the impacts of the disease. Dr. Willis has authored or co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and his group's research on WNS has been covered in the national and international media, including on CBC's The National, The Current, and Quarks and Quarks, and by BBC News, The Guardian, and The Wall Street Journal. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Willis. Thanks so much for that uh, kind introduction, Caitlin, and for the invitation today. I'll just move this out of the way. Um, Right, so uh, uh, thanks everyone uh, for tuning in and um, for joining the webinar. Uh, and again, to, to Caitlin and the Prairie Conservation Action Plan for the invitation to talk to you today. Uh, as Caitlin mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about white nose syndrome in bats and a bit of an occupational hazard when you work on bats um, is comparison to this character. Uh, university communications people, newspaper reporters, they seem not to be able to resist uh, calling, uh, calling folks like me Batman or Batwoman or Batgirl. Um, and so thank you, Caitlin, for not uh, referring to me uh, in that context in your introduction. Uh, I don't, if you, if you knew me, you would realize I don't do nearly enough push-ups or sit-ups. I do more like this many push-ups or sit-ups, so best to leave Batman aside, and we'll just talk about the real thing today. I uh, want to acknowledge, before I get started, uh, a series of amazing collaborators and students and postdocs who have done much uh, to all of the heavy lifting on various projects I'm uh, going to talk about today. Uh, all of this work is a massive uh, team effort, um, and uh, my colleagues and, and students are a small part of a big North American and worldwide team tackling, uh, tackling this disease. So uh, the, the pathogen that 
causes our bat disease, white nose syndrome, falls into a category that, uh, that I've referred to as conservation pathogens. These are uh, usually microbes, uh, disease-causing organisms that have really massive conservation-relevant impacts on their hosts. And so a few examples here. We're going to talk quite a lot about bats and white nose syndrome, this white stuff growing on this bat. Uh, probably more famous or at least longer known is amphibian chytridiomycosis, which has led to extinctions of multiple frog species throughout the world over the last several decades. A more recent one is sea star wasting disease. The, the mechanisms of disease in, in this issue, this conservation pathogen are still being worked out, but essentially has caused millions of sea stars of many species around the world to disintegrate, a horrible disease where uh, the sea stars basically fall apart and, and die. Right. Um, these aren't really prairie examples. I know this is a prairie interested uh, audience, but there are, of course, prairie examples of conservation pathogens. Something like uh, plague in prairie dogs is one we've known about for a while, or rattlesnake fungal disease is a relatively new one. These are pathogens that cause major impacts on hosts. And so conservation pathogens tend to have a few uh, sort of features in common. Uh, one of uh, those features is what we refer to as density independent transmission. And that simply means it doesn't matter whether the host is rare or common for the pathogen to get spread. Uh, with density independent transmission, often you have a really low density of hosts if your pathogen has killed most of your hosts. Uh, if the pathogen can persist in an environmental reservoir, or if there are multiple species that can transmit the pathogen that vary in how susceptible uh, they are to that pathogen, you can still get it spread even if your host is rare. Right? And so those kinds of pathogens can uh, drive host populations to extinction. Often conservation pathogens are invasive species. They've come from somewhere else and they're impacting uh, naive hosts that haven't evolved some mechanism of, of resistance or tolerance to that particular organism. And finally, uh, conservation pathogens may impact hosts that are already threatened by some other uh, form of impact, like habitat loss or habitat fragmentation. Uh, and that's something we'll come back to a bit later on, uh, the importance of the environment, uh, both in uh, the sort of impacts of white nose syndrome, but uh, I think especially in how we might respond uh, to, uh, to the disease from a management perspective. And so what I want to do uh, over the next uh, while in my talk is uh, basically divide what I'll talk about into three sections. First, I want to talk a bit about uh, some work we've done to just understand the basics of white nose syndrome. What are the mechanisms of disease um, in this horrible wildlife disease? What's it doing to bats? Um, obviously, we want to try and protect our bat populations from the disease. So uh, for the second part, I'll talk a little bit about how we might take some of what we've learned about mechanisms and apply it to management. And finally, just briefly at the end, I'd like to talk a little bit about some lessons that I think we've learned from the research and management response to white nose syndrome that are potentially applicable to other conservation pathogens and in fact are being applied uh, in the case of some new diseases that have emerged, like sea star wasting disease, uh, like rattlesnake fungal disease or snake fungal disease. Uh, and a couple of take home mess messages that I hope to leave you with by the end of the talk. First, that wildlife pathogens are an important issue for conservation. I'm not gonna have time to talk too much about the public health side today, but they're also important from a public health perspective and maybe we can touch on that towards the end. Uh, and second, uh, like many people that work in conservation and work with the endangered species, I tend to op uh, oscillate between hopefulness and despair. Lately, though, I'm sort of on the hopeful side, and I think that uh, with enough resources, with enough investment, we can potentially manage for these kinds of complex multi-host pathogen outbreaks that uh, are associated with conservation pathogens. 
Uh, before I get to that stuff, though, I think it's worth talking a little bit about why we should care about bats specifically. Uh, we definitely should care about wildlife disease. Bats, I think we should care about for a few reasons. First, they're just cool. These are some uh, nighttime uh, video images, high-speed cinematography uh, images collected by a documentary film crew that visited some of our field sites to see our prairie little brown bats in Manitoba last summer. And just watching bats fly, this amazing maneuverability, this amazing ability to get around in complete darkness under their own power. It's hard for anyone who's remotely interested in nature not to be a bit interested in that. Um, and so I think they're just cool in their own right. Um, that ability to fly under their own power has led to an extraordinary diversification. Bats occur everywhere on Earth where there is forest for them to live in. Uh, they've diversified into well over 1,200 species. One in five mammal species is a bat, and you end up with some unbelievable characters. These are all tropical species, but you've got bats with tubes on their noses. You've got bats with fringes on their heads the handsome, beautiful, wrinkle-faced bat. Um, you've got bats with suction cups on uh, their wrists and ankles so they can hang on the insides of leaves. Uh, this species with a resonating chamber on its face in the males so it can make sounds that are beautiful to, to females. Uh, amazing diversification, amazing radiation throughout the world. There are some great stories uh, about bats from a co-evolutionary perspective. This species is called the tube-lipped nectar bat, and this individual has been trained to drink sugar water like a hummingbird from a test tube. It feeds on a flower with an incredibly long nectar tube, and this long thing snaking down to the bottom of the test tube is its tongue. It's longer than its body. It's got a special structure in its chest so it can fold this thing up as it goes from flower to flower. Extraordinary story of coevolution. There are many, and we could go on all afternoon, uh, but another favorite of mine that shows that sort of not all bats are, are brown and, uh, and drab looking, the little tiny, here's one in someone's hand, Honduran white bat, uh, a little philostomid bat with this wrinkly little nose and uh, a nose leaf. Uh, this is an example of a tent-making bat. Uh, a whole series of species of bats chew the backs of leaves in the tropics and make these nice tents that fold over them um, and create a shelter for their, uh, their social groups. In the prairies, uh, compared to tropical region, re regions, obviously we have much lower diversity, but in the Manitoba prairies, for example, we have six species of bats. Uh, three of those species are like the hoary bat and the silver-haired bat uh, that fly south for uh, the winter. They're just starting to return at this time of year. Um, and uh, they uh, spend virtually all of their life cycle in forest, in trees, uh, but uh, are found in many small towns throughout, uh, throughout the Canadian prairies. Right. Our other three Manitoba prairie bats are hibernators. Uh, and this little brown bat is the one we're going to talk most about today. Um, these species hibernate underground for the winter. In Manitoba, we're lucky to have uh, a series of caves in the interlake region between Lake Manitoba and Lake Winnipeg. Lots of fantastic uh, hibernation habitat for, uh, for these species. Uh, so neat aspects of their biology, incredible diversity around the world, uh, but also ecologically and economically important. In Canada, all of our bats eat insects. Um, we don't have good data for Canada at this point, but there uh, are some experiments from the tropics and one really neat experiment from uh, the Midwestern US that shows if you exclude bats from foraging over corn crops, if you put a big exclosure over the crops at night and prevent bats from feeding on insects above that crop, you get significantly more pest damage uh, in those crops. And scaling those results up, estimates suggest bats are worth billions for agriculture. Uh, in the US. So they're uh, ecologically and economically important, as well as just being cool and interesting. 
Uh, and so for that reason, when biologists in New York State went into their hibernation sites to count bats in the wintertime to do their annual surveys for bats, instead of finding scenes like this with clusters and cuddles of bats all hanging out together on the ceiling and walls of the cave, uh, huddling together throughout the winter, they found devastating scenes like this. Carpets of dead bats littering the floors of those hibernation sites, uh, little skeletons um, mixed in with the substrate, and a few individuals surviving with this white stuff all over their noses, their ears, and, uh, and all, all over their wings. And so that white stuff on the noses led to a name pretty quickly, white nose syndrome. Uh, that white stuff was quickly identified as a fungus that we now uh, refer to as Pseudogymnoascus destructans or PD for short. Um, people quickly worked out that it's cold tolerant. Uh, we can't get it, humans can't get it, for example, because it doesn't grow above about 20 degrees. So it's uh, adapted to grow at cold temperatures above freezing um, and hibernating bat skin during the winter time is the perfect temperature for growth of this particular fungus. Uh, folks also quickly worked out that the fungus was only invading the skin. So the bats didn't have systemic infections. It wasn't infecting uh, organs and deep tissues. This was a cutaneous infection. Um, and so uh, people quickly gathered when we saw uh, hundreds of thousands of dead bats. A small group of folks gathered in uh, Albany, New York, near the first discovery of this disease in June of 2008. And this was a group of a few people that studied bats, but also uh, experienced people in wildlife uh, veterinary disease, wildlife pathologists, um, experts in uh, wildlife pathogens. And one of the consistent uh, messages we heard at this meeting was that uh, it must be something other than the fungus because fungal pathogens don't kill mammals. Fungal pathogens kill plants um, and sometimes they kill amphibians. And as we've seen from chytridiomycosis, they can kill amphibians in massive numbers. But we don't tend to see a lot of uh, really deadly fungal diseases of mammals unless the mammals are already immunocompromised. And so people hypothesize that something else was the driving cause and that this fungus was a secondary uh, uh, infection, a secondary result of some other environmental change potentially. Um, a few of us thought maybe the white stuff growing all over the bats could help explain why bats were dying. And so we set out to do some experiments to test that hypothesis. Can the fungus alone cause the disease in bats? And so we collected some little brown bats from the wild, brought them back to the lab, uh, to our uh, very high humidity and low temperature incubators, um, conditions that closely match good hibernation conditions for bats in nature. We attached little uh, temperature sensitive data loggers, backpacks to each bat so we could record their hibernation uh, body temperatures. And then we inoculated them with the fungus and sham inoculated a control group. Uh, so uh, we wanted to test whether we could replicate disease in uh, in healthy bats and otherwise healthy bats. Uh, and what did we find? Well, sure enough, our uh, inoculated bats had the characteristic signs of the disease. Uh, on the left here, we've got a cross-section micrograph, micro, a, a tiny image um, with the scale bar about 50 microns here, uh, showing a cross-section of bat wing skin. So the black stuff is the sort of epidermis and there's a little bit of muscle and lots of blood vessels. Um, and then uh, this really sort of uh, incredible skin uh, stretched between the finger bones. In infected bats, we saw lesions. The whole wing didn't look like this image on the right, 
but the fungus formed lesions in that wing tissue where uh, these all of these sort of squigglies are fungal hyphae or fungal tissue. And here this is fungus growing on the surface where the skin has been broken open. And just superficially, the wings look very different in the inoculated bats. So uh, some features of the disease clearly caused simply by the fungus alone in otherwise healthy bats. Now, what did we see in terms of hibernation body temperatures? Well, recall we put these temperature backpacks on the bats to understand what they're doing in hibernation. Uh, what m hibernating mammals do during hibernation is spend most of their time at low body temperatures. So here I've plotted uh, skin temperature or body temperature over about a three month period. And what you'll see is that uh, a healthy bat is spending about three weeks or so, a couple of weeks at this really low body temperature, about seven degrees. And every few weeks or so, it rewarms to a normal body temperature. It spends a ton of stored fat to do this. Uh, and in fact, most of the bat, most of the fat that bats store in the fall to prepare for hibernation is spent on these periodic arousals to a normal body temperature. Okay. Well, what happened with our infected bats? Uh, they started out hibernating normally, but uh, by about day 50 day to day 70, they start warming up much too often. Uh, and that's a worry for uh, otherwise healthy bats because each of these arousals costs about three weeks worth of fat, uh, dramatically shortens how long the bats might be able to survive if they're warming up too much and burning through their fat reserves too quickly. Now, at around the time of our 2008 uh, White Nose Syndrome meeting, uh, we were finding uh, in the northeastern U.S. in a number of places uh, really massive die-offs of bats and this white stuff growing on bats. Uh, folks in the old world started to wonder whether uh, this fungus was something they needed to worry about. And so they started looking for white stuff growing on bats. This is one of the early maps where folks found uh, white fungus growing on bats. These uh, red spots are all places where uh, the, uh, the fungus was found on bats in the old world. But importantly, there was uh, no die-off of bats being observed in the old world. And that raises a couple of possibilities, a couple of hypotheses. One of these is that our uh, North American fungus, the one killing our bats, is an invasive species from Europe. The other is that this fungus had already occurred on bats in both North America and Europe, but something funny had happened in North America to suddenly make it deadly. Perhaps there'd been a mutation in the fungus, perhaps there'd been an environmental change that affected its virulence or how severe disease it might cause. And so we tested that by taking fungus isolated from bats in Europe that wasn't killing European bats and tested whether we could cause disease in our North American bats. And sure enough, when we did that, we saw the exact same effects as our North American uh, fungus. The European fungus caused disease that was equally severe for North American bats, which means their fungus uh, in the old world is, uh, is deadly for our bats and it's consistent with this invasive species hypothesis. Uh, also consistent with this hypothesis is the fact that one of the first sites where white nose syndrome was discovered is a major tourist attraction uh, in, uh, in uh, New York State uh, in the northeastern U.S. Gets thousands and thousands of visitors every year. You can take lantern tours, you can take boat tours, you can get married in the cave if that's something that happens to interest you. Uh, lots of people visit this place. We'll probably never know for sure exactly how it got here, but uh, that provides some circumstantial evidence that perhaps a tourist tracked uh, the fungus across uh, on their boots and it uh, was exposed to our bats that way. Well, what happened once it arrived? This map shows uh, the spread of the disease from this epicenter near Albany, New York, between about 2006 and 2016. And we'll just let that animation play. 
uh, red spots are where both fungus and disease were confirmed as of 2016. And you can see it spread incredibly quickly across uh, the eastern half of the continent. Um, it's now spread into well into Manitoba, into the Interlake, and worryingly in 2016, it jumped across the Rocky Mountains, and it now appears to be spreading from an epicenter um, uh, in Washington state. So it's spread uh, quickly and rapidly, almost certainly spread by bats, perhaps initially spread to some extent by people as well. So where are we now? We now know that about 17 species have been found carrying the fungus. 11 of those are more or less affected. We've seen some evidence of uh, at least small population declines. Um, and we know, so that is one of the features that can make for a nasty conservation pathogen. If you've got multiple host species that vary in their susceptibility. Another factor I mentioned early on that uh, leads to or can contribute to a conservation pathogen is uh, the ability to survive in the environment without the host. And our fungus does that very nicely. It can live in caves when bats aren't there. So bats can get reinfected when they return to an infected cave in the fall. Um, and uh, it's had massive impact on at least a few species. We've lost count of how many animals have been killed in total, but it's definitely in the millions, uh, almost certainly, uh, if not the fastest, among the fastest declines of wild mammals ever observed. Um, and as a result, we've now listed three species as federally endangered in Canada. And so these are some plots from a recent paper uh, by Fred Frick uh, at Bat Conservation Internet. International, uh, showing declines in size of a couple of colonies. You can see there is a massive crash uh, within about two years of detection of the fungus. And then these particular colonies have stayed at really low levels. They haven't quite winked out yet. What we also see in those colonies is that fungal load, the other set of data on these plots, uh, has uh, increased in those caves and then stabilized at a high level. So there's fungus there and that fungus isn't going away despite how rare our hosts happen to be. Now, my students and I have been uh, most focused on trying to understand uh, why a simple fungal skin infection would cause bats to warm up too much and potentially burn through uh, their energy too quickly. And so one of the first places we looked was at healthy hibernators. Uh, why do healthy hibernators do those periodic arousals or do those periodic warm-ups during the winter? What causes them to do that? Um, we don't have a clear answer for that. It's probably a multi-pronged cause. There are probably multiple um, sort of physiological issues that cause that to happen. But uh, one thing that probably contributes is dehydration. During the, those long bouts at low body temperature, the bats are losing a little bit of water. And in fact, they lose water constantly, even across folded up wings uh, as uh, they're sitting there hibernating. And so uh, one of the things they do when they warm up is take a drink, um, and we wondered if the fungus growing into this highly vascularized wing tissue could create injuries leading to increased fluid loss, thereby causing bats to rewarm too quickly. And so we looked at blood samples from our inoculation experiment to try and understand what was going on with infected versus uninfected bats. And we saw a couple of things. One of the things we saw was that our infected bats had much, much lower levels of plasma electrolytes. That is the same stuff you drink in Gatorade after a big workout. Um, has dropped to much lower levels. And so our bats are low in important plasma electrolytes. Um, and they also had signs of dramatic fluid loss. Their hematocrit levels, this is on a log scale, so you can't actually uh, tell the number, but uh, hematocrit uh, is basically a measure of how concentrated your red blood cells are. And if you have really high hematocrit levels as our infected bats do, you've basically got very little plasma. Um, or you've got blood that's becoming somewhat pudding-like. 
because you're so dehydrated. That can be one cause of very high hematocrit levels. And so we're seeing evidence of low plasma electrolytes and really severe dehydration. This is consistent with the same uh, kinds of, uh, of blood chemistry that we, uh, and, and blood physiology that we see in people with severe injuries that have lost a lot of fluid. Uh, people with uh, severe burns uh, sometimes show these, these kinds of patterns. Um, and so we wondered whether our, uh, uh, the lesions caused in the wings of the bats were driving this kind of pattern. These things could drive more periodic arousals. We also wondered about uh, what was going on in terms of uh, measurements of water loss in real time. And so to get at this question, we took infected bats versus uninfected bats, and we used a technique called respirometry, where we can seal the animals in a little chamber, and then we pump air into that chamber that uh, has a known water concentration or a known level of humidity. It's got a known level of oxygen in it, and it's got a known uh, level of CO2. And so the bats lose water into that airstream. They also lose CO2 or they give off CO2 and they take in oxygen. And so we can use all of this equipment on the right to measure those was three parameters in the airstream coming out of the chamber to tell us about the metabolic rates of the animals, their levels of oxygen consumption and CO2 production, as well as how much water they're losing. And so when we do that, we see a few things. Uh, this top graph shows rates of ev evaporative water loss in infected bats in the gray bars and control bats in the white bars under a couple of conditions really humid air, similar to what they experience in their caves, and dry air, um, which is pretty artificial for a hibernating bat. We can see that in dry air, that effect is really pronounced. The in control bats have much lower water loss. Infected bats are losing a whole lot more water. But that effect exists in the wet air in the natural uh, hibernation environment as well. This is potentially important from a management perspective because uh, one uh, feature that uh, some folks have suggested we might consider modifying to reduce how well the fungus can grow is the humidity of hibernation sites. If we can make them a little less humid, a little drier, uh, could we slow down the growth of the fungus while still allowing some bats to survive even though they need it humid? This suggests that while that could be a possibility. Uh, in dry air, we're seeing a much bigger effect of uh, infection on water loss in the bats, which could cause a problem for that kind of management, uh, management approach. Uh, what was consistent with our dehydration hypothesis as well is that the rates of evaporative water loss in our infected bats, so just in our gray bars, were uh, positively correlated with the severity of damage from the fungus on their wings. So the more damaged the wings, presumably the more lesions on the wings, the more fluid these animals are losing, uh, consistent with the dehydration hypothesis. So what do we know about mechanism? Well, uh, we know that uh, bats with white nose syndrome suffer from increased water loss with electrolyte depletion that seems to be driving this increased arousal frequency, and that increased arousal frequency is causing bats to burn through their fat reserves much, uh, much, much too quickly. So a skin infection is really causing a catastrophic disruption of hibernation energy balance. Bats with this disease, they've stored up a whole bunch of fat in the fall, but that fat isn't enough to see them through to the spring with these uh, extra uh, physiological consequences of, uh, of the fungus. And so uh, that leads us into the second uh, part of what I'd like to talk about today, how we might use some of what we've learned about the disease to maybe try and help some bat populations to try and do some management. Um, and I think one of the first things we've done, this is a, a it's a little bit low hanging fruit, although it hasn't necessarily been easy, uh, but once we were able to show that, yes, indeed, the fungus was what was killing the bats, 
that uh, gave some uh, justification for really doing uh, a job of convincing people uh, to properly decontaminate their boots when they visit caves, uh, to get researchers and cavers to be very conscious of biosafety so that we reduce the rate of spread of the disease, at least reduce the, uh, the chance that people can spread it from place to place. And so uh, those of us doing research on bats, the tens of thousands of people that are, uh, that are cavers in the, U, in the United States that visit caves reg regularly for recreation and research, those people are now uh, doing a whole lot more of this decontamination, which has been really important. Uh, what we've also done in Canada is list three species as endangered, and in the U.S., one of those species has been listed as threatened. One of the things that's supposed to happen when we do that, and it's happening uh, to a greater or lesser extent, is that we protect habitat, um, and maybe we enhance habitat. Um, and that's something I want to come back to a bit later on. Uh, these species are being impacted by a disease, uh, but uh, the disease is one of many potential impacts. And so like many endangered species, um, protecting habitat could be a really important management response to help the few bats that survive the disease um, uh, make it through the active season and reproduce, or make it through hibernation uh, despite this fungus. We also wanted to try uh, some more direct interventions. And so people have tried a whole range of things. One of the things we set out to try as soon as we saw our blood data showing the low electrolyte levels and the really bad dehydration was to use an approach that wildlife rehabilitation experts use all the time for bats and, uh, and uh, other animals. And that's uh, supplementation with an electrolyte um, and calorie supplement like Pedialyte, for example. We often give this to kids with diarrhea, um, uh, but it also works for animals. And so we set out to test whether we could say put uh, a drinking uh, supply of something like Pedialyte in a hibernation site and would bats drink from it? Would it help them do better to stave off this nasty symptom of infection? And so here we're looking in, this is a, a, a an infrared image. So we're looking down from the top of a cage of bats um, into the bottom of the cage. And there are two dishes here. One of them has water. One of them has Pedialyte. And then here's a cluster of hibernating bats with white nose syndrome. And so we tested whether we had three cages set up that look like this, one with a Pedialyte and water option for the bats, one with two dishes of water as a control, and one simply with dextrose in the same concentration that that sugar occurs in or is prepared in Pedialyte. We left the electrolytes out to see if energy supplementation alone might benefit the bats. And what did we see? Well, sadly, um, these are survival curves on the right um, and the bats with the treatment, either dextrose or Pedialyte, didn't do any better. In fact, the Pedialyte bats did a little bit worse, although those differences weren't significant. And we also saw, if anything, there was more fungus in the Pedialyte group than in the dextrose or water group. So uh, we didn't see any benefit of this potential treatment. Uh, another option might be to try and clean some of the environmental reservoir. And a few approaches have been suggested for doing this. One relatively recent one suggested by Dan Lindner and his colleagues at the US Forest Service is to use UV light. What we're looking at here are growth plates of our nasty fungus. So this is PD grown from different varieties of PD or different isolates of PD collected from different places. Uh, and what you see in these dishes is that uh, this fungus is really growing very nicely, but if you uh, irradiate your plates with some ultraviolet radiation, you don't get any fungal growth at all. The UV light really knocks back the fungus. Uh, and that makes sense because we're dealing with a fungus here that's adapted to a very dark environment. It does not like a sunburn. 
and it can't take ultraviolet light, right? Importantly though, when uh, Lindner and his colleagues looked at other uh, types of microbes that occur in caves, uh, there was no effect or very little effect of UV light on most of those things. Uh, that's important because if we were to go in and treat a hibernation site for our particular fungus, we don't want to wipe out all the other microbes in that site, many of which might be potentially important for all sorts of reasons. We don't understand the microbial biology of caves very well at all, and so you can have unintended consequences if you do a treatment without understanding its effects. This suggests that UV light will be relatively specific to our fungus. And so we don't have results for this yet, but here's a student from my lab, we're working with Dan and others to actually test whether we can use UV light in an infected cave to reduce the environmental reservoir for PD um, and hopefully not impact other uh, microbes in that cave. Uh, lots of other potential treatments have been suggested. Uh, the numbers up to maybe 30 things have been suggested that readily kill PD in a petri dish. And so here we're looking at different dishes. On the left, these all have lots of PD growing in them. On the right, here you can see where a bacterium called Pseudomonas fluorescens has resulted in this zone of inhibition in that petri dish. It's basically killed the fungus close to the bacteria, right? Here, this cold pressed Valencia oil has killed uh, the fungus very nicely. Another bacterium, Rhodococcus, kills it very nicely. Lots of things kill the fungus. So far though, only one experiment has uh, really clearly shown uh, a strong survival benefit, um, or at least one agent has shown a survival benefit, and that's a bacterium called Pseudomonas fluorescens. Uh, when we took this bacterium and inoculated infected bats with it in the laboratory, we were able to improve survival by close to 30%. So we didn't get anywhere near the survival of pre-white nose syndrome healthy bats, but we did uh, have more bats survive when we applied this bacterium to their wings. That suggests the potential that this stuff could work in nature um, if we were to go in and uh, be able to find enough bats to treat with it in the winter time. That might work in some places, and there are probably some caves uh, and hibernation sites where that might be a possibility. Uh, the trick is, in much of North America, in fact, in most of Western North America, we don't have a good handle on where bats are hibernating. Uh, in Saskatchewan, for example, we don't know where any little brown bats hibernate during the winter. Uh, and so that makes it very difficult to treat animals you can't find. Uh, and so uh, there may be other uh, approaches that we need to explore that don't necessarily target bats in the wintertime. So what about mechanisms to management? Uh, we know that liquid nutrient electrolyte supplementation, based on our experiment, uh, it didn't, it's not going to work. The bats didn't prefer the electrolyte supplement um, and they, uh, they didn't do any better if that was provided in their cages. In some places, there are some chemical or biological agents that might certainly help. Uh, but there are lots of parts of the continent where we can't find enough bats to treat. And so that uh, might make that approach tricky. We probably can't put all our eggs in that basket. Um, and finally, we know that some bats uh, survive the disease. Uh, one possibility is that perhaps we can facilitate the evolution of survival traits in those populations. And so a question we've been especially interested in my lab recently is whether we can improve the reproductive potential of bats that have heritable survival traits. Um, one of the reasons that's important, I've shown you these two curves already, showing massive declines in some of our hibernation sites, but in other caves, we're seeing a different story. Yes, there's still lots of fungus in these two other hibernation sites, uh, but uh, the populations are rebounding in these sites, and we're not totally sure why that might be. One possible trait, though, that uh, we think may have something uh, to do with this survival and this appearance of recovery is how fat bats get in the fall 
and the timing of their normal emergence from hibernation. We don't know much about this from bats yet. We're working hard on it uh, in our lab and others are too, but we do have some data from ground squirrels. We know a little bit about hibernation phenology and energy reserves in ground squirrels. This is the ubiquitous Richardson's ground squirrel. And when you see the first ground squirrels of the year come out in late winter, you can be really sure what they're thinking. Uh, they're uh, thinking about sex. They're males that are coming out to defend a territory and to get ready for mating season. We don't know who they're thinking about. We have to speculate about that, uh, but they're definitely thinking about the reproductive season. They come out early and they store extra energy in the fall to allow them to come out early before there's any food available. This is really similar to what female bats do. Female bats come out of hibernation in the spring long before there are any insects and they are still living on stored fat, presumably so they can get ready for reproduction, so they can get ready to raise their pups. And so we've been uh, sort of trying to build on this evidence from ground squirrels that the timing of emergence and energy reserves in ground squirrels is heritable and it affects fitness. So that means it can evolve. Uh, that uh, creates some potential for the evolution of, uh, say, fall fat stores and emergence timing to evolve in bats if it's also heritable in our bats. And so we've been trying to get at this with a marked population of bats in central Canada. We've been using pit tags. So we inject little microchips into bats. So far, we've injected about 12,000 bats. And then we mount antennas that look like these, this square fly-through antenna or a pass-by antenna uh, at the entrances of caves so we can record when different individuals go in and out uh, and the timing of their emergence. Uh, we also recapture some bats to assess body condition at different times of year. And so what we're finding so far, we don't have evidence of heritability yet, but we are finding evidence of really high between year repeatability, which leaves open the door that this trait is, uh, these traits are heritable. Uh, emergence date, for example, when uh, bats come out of hibernation, uh, about 40% of the variation in those data is explained by repeatability or um, bats that tend to come out early in one year also come out early in the next year. Also really highly repeatable is fall body mass. Bats that tend to get fat in the fall in one year also tend to get fat in the fall in the next year. And one hypothesis is that those bats storing large fat reserves can best tolerate infection throughout the winter and are the most likely to survive. We're interested in uh, understanding that, that process. So we've been wondering whether we can support the evolution of uh, improved energy balance in bats suffering from white nose syndrome. And one of the ways we might do that is again, relying on uh, habitat. And in this case, perhaps improving summer habitat. We know that bats love warm roosts to raise their pups. Presumably if they're in worse condition in spring, having just survived the fungus, they'll need to have even better roosts to recover from the disease and to raise pups. And so what we've been testing is actually whether we can enhance roost structures for bats. This is uh, one of the ways we're testing this using a heated bat box that we raise uh, to a slightly higher temperature than normal to try and improve spring and summer roosts and improve recovery from the disease and reproduction by those survivors. We've got some evidence that little brown bats really love these hot boxes in the summertime. This is a flight enclosure experiment where we've got one heated box and three regular temperature boxes in this flight tent, we let a bunch of bats go into the flight tent. So one hot box, three regular ambient temperature boxes. And what we find is that the proportion of bats in that one hot box is much, much higher almost all the time. Sometimes they're kind of evenly distributed, but on several nights in this experiment, all the bats went into just one of the boxes. So just a, a really strong preference. And so we've been working with landowners all over central Canada, uh, from uh, western Manitoba into central Ontario, to test out 
these prototype heated bat boxes at known bat colonies. We've set these up either heated boxes or control boxes at existing colonies that the public has, ha, has told us about. Um, we're testing these out. We're not recommending that people put them up themselves yet because it is possible they could make things worse if they encourage bats to aggregate much more than they otherwise might, it's possible that um, uh, this kind of enhancement could actually increase the spread of our fungus. Um, and that's something that we're actively testing and we definitely want to rule out before we recommend uh, folks taking this approach. So improving roosting habitat is one way you can improve energy balance for bats. Another way is to improve the intake side of the energy budget. Can we help bats get fatter in the fall before hibernation? And I don't have much to tell you about uh, this project yet because we're just setting out to test it. We're trying to see if we can create uh, enhanced patches of prey high insect densities close to hibernation sites for bats so that it's easier for them to get fat before they go into hibernation. Can we help more bats and especially juvenile bats get fatter so they have a better chance of making it through the winter with white nose syndrome? Okay, I'm just about finished and I, I just wanna quickly go through uh, some lessons I think we've learned uh, from white nose syndrome that uh, hopefully will be of interest to some of the folks on, uh, on, the, on the call today. Uh, one of uh, the things I think that uh, we've learned from this disease is, uh, and this may be preaching to the choir uh, for many of you, uh, but baseline pre-disease data were incredibly important for our initial response. Uh, this sounds strange to say, but we were lucky in our disease in having one of our uh, species first affected was already federally endangered. The Indiana bat or Myotis sodalis was in the sort of epicenter of white nose syndrome right from the beginning. And that meant for the sites where uh, this bat occurred, we had amazing long-term data long-term census data, count data to help us understand the impacts uh, on this species, but also the other species that shared hibernation sites with, with uh, Indiana bats. And in the US, we also had federal coordination right away. The US Fish and Wildlife Service, because we're dealing with a federally endangered bat, could provide some real leadership immediately. Um, and I think white nose syndrome uh, kind of broke out in just about the perfect place to have a reasonably fast response. We've had some hiccups in terms of this lesson along the way, but I think in general, we've had really great coordination between scientists and managers. I've shown you this picture of our first white nose syndrome meeting. Now the white nose syndrome workshop every year attracts this many people and many, many more on webinars and calls like this one with both scientists and managers really closely integrated in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, I think that's really helped us make amazing progress. Uh, citizen science has also helped and it's, uh, uh, I'm sure that's no uh, sort of, this issue is no stranger to folks on this call either. Um, most of the original observations of white nose syndrome in Ontario and uh, many in Quebec came from concerned citizens reporting uh, unusual behavior by bats. Uh, we've since uh, partnered with uh, the Quebec government and the Quebec Center for Biodiversity Science, who set up this amazing website, the Neighborhood Bat Watch. Uh, we've expanded it to Ontario and, and uh, Manitoba, and it's spreading to other parts of the country where folks can report bat colonies, report their observations of bats, and we're getting great information from, uh, from the Bat Watch site. Finally, just want to end with uh, my take home messages. Uh, again, I think. White nose syndrome is a great example of uh, an important conservation pathogen. There are many others, uh, and this is uh, really a problem for wildlife conservation, but also for people. Um, and uh, finally, I think even though we have no solutions yet, uh, we've made tremendous pro uh, progress by learning from uh, diseases that have come before white nose syndrome. And uh, I think uh, the response to white nose syndrome is helping newly emerged disease response teams deal with their uh, issues uh, even more quickly as well.
Uh, and so with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. And I think if there's a little time for questions, I'll try and answer them as well as I can. Wow, thank you so much. I can see why people call you Batman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a, that was a fascinating talk. I, I can't get over it. It's really amazing, the information that, that you provided with us today. So thank you so much for taking the time to share all of your, your wealth. And um, to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions, please feel free to type it in. And um, there's one listener uh, named Rebecca who typed in thanks. So thank you very much for that great talk. Um, I also want to remind our listeners too, if you when you leave the presentation, there will be a quick one-minute survey that will pop out. If you don't mind filling that out, that gives us um, the resources we need to uh, report back to our funders and keep this information, keep our native price speaker series going into the future. Um, Craig, can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in BATS to begin with? That is, uh, yeah, that's a great question. I uh, am some of you from the prairies will uh, know the name Mark Brigham from uh, the University of Regina. I'll embarrass him. Uh, as an undergrad, I took a field course um, between second and third year of my undergrad with Mark, as well as two other uh, great professors. Um, and I, I wasn't convinced at that point that I wanted to be uh, to study bats forever, but I was uh, convinced after that two-week course that studying wild animals in nature was for me, and uh, that's uh, all I wanted to do from that point in my career. I ended up uh, joining Mark's lab for graduate school later, um, and so I have, I've got a Saskatchewan uh, connection in, in terms of my training for sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say great professors and great hands-on learning experience as an undergrad was what what got me hooked yeah what's kept me hooked is we work on other things in the lab too we do some work on chipmunks and small mammals um, but what's kept me hooked uh, a little bit is uh, how sort of mysterious uh, misunderstood and uh, and really different from other mammals they are. That seems like an obvious thing to say, but uh, their biology is really weird in all sorts of ways, and most species we don't understand very much about at all. And that's an exciting thing to um, to sort of work on as a biologist. Yes. What do you think is the most important step in um, you know in helping bats with white nose syndrome? Is it learning more about this species that we don't know much about, or is it kind of be on the forefront with white nose syndrome? Yeah, that, well, that's a great question. Um, and it's one that the whole sort of response team, all the people in that big photo I just showed, grapple with every year when we mm -hmm. sort of update the, update the strategy. I think uh, what we've kind of figured out so far, and what we hoped for initially is that, oh, there'll be some cure. We'll find a cure for this disease. Um, I don't think we're going to find one single magic bullet, just as there isn't one single impact on, usually on wildlife populations. Yes, white nose syndrome is the worst one for these particular animals right now for hibernating bats, but they're impacted by other things too. And so I think, again, mixing a range of strategies is going to be important. That means we need to fund and support and undertake a pretty broad range of research from lab-based, say, vaccine trials. Um, there's some promising work being done on vaccines uh, for our fungus. There's some promising work being done on topical treatments, some great work on habitat modification and enhancement. So I, I think it's going to be uh, a multi-pronged sort of strategy. Mm, great answer. Thank you. Um, one of our listeners named Susan, um, she says, thanks for the fantastic talk. Um, she would also like to know if you have any particular suggestions for enhancing foraging habitat in the eastern slopes of the Rockies where we think bats are hibernating in crevices. Very interesting. So one of the things we know about uh, our little brown bats is that they, you know, they seem to be kind of generalist foragers. They'll eat little bugs that are flying up above our heads but what we find uh, in their diet really frequently are wetland insects um, and so one of the the things that may be useful is increasing the abundance of those species 
um, uh, if if that's possible in uh, in that particular environment, things like mayflies and midges um, they tend to devour. Um, so uh, if they're around, they'll they'll eat them for sure. Uh, we uh, one of the things we're trying to do, and we'll be starting to test um, over the next couple of years, are other things that help encourage insects to aggregate. So. Um, one possibility is uh, lights. Can we make a prey patch using lights just to make it a bit easier for bats to forage and get fat before hibernation? Um, we're going to test it. Uh, I, again, I don't think that can be a magic bullet either. You would have to provide so many more insects that it would be um, that it might be tricky to help a whole bunch of bats survive that otherwise wouldn't. Uh, but uh, it's worth a shot, and we're going to we're going to test it out. Thank you. Thanks for that answer. Um, a listener named Becky would like to know if you can confirm that the potential use of UV to kill PD would be used in caves um, and on cave walls when the bats are not using the cave. Is that correct? Well, that's the that's the goal. So, uh, okay. in, yeah, that would be the goal is to develop a, an intensity uh, of the treatment that we could use in the summertime when the bats aren't there and clean the fungus as best we can out of the cave. Um, whether one treatment per year is going to allow us to knock the fungus back enough is an open question. So maybe we come up with a regime where we go in once a month or something during the summertime. Um, the issue is though, it, it, you, you could potentially do a UV treatment that uh, is not of high enough intensity to, um, well, a couple of things. There's one issue, we don't like to go into caves when there are bats there because it disturbs the bats. We know they can tolerate a little bit of extra disturbance, but we're very careful not to go very often. Um, so that's one reason that treatments during winter, all treatments might be potentially uh, harmful or at least have some negative side effect because we're disturbing bats. Um, and arousing them from hibernation. The other issue is harm to the animals from UV, and obviously we wouldn't want to uh, wouldn't want to cause that um, if the bats were there when treatments were happening. Uh, and so we would want to be very, very careful that we're using the right duration of exposure that really hits the fungus but doesn't hit the bats. If the two things, if bats were to be there when treatment was happening, duration and uh, intensity would both be really important. And that's something folks are working on. What, uh, what duration and intensity does a great job of killing the fungus without killing other things um, and without obviously harming bats. Thank you for that answer. Um, a lizard named Tracy would like to know if, um, if we know this use of bat boxes might help or hinder the spread of white nose, and she's thinking um, in urban areas, areas such as Calgary. Right. Um, I, you know, bat. This is a really interesting question. We, and I, I, I like to advocate things for which there is evidence. And at the moment, we actually, I would say, don't have great evidence that bat boxes per se have caused bat populations to stabilize or get bigger. Um, that said, we know that bats need good roosting habitat. Um, and uh, I think it stands to reason from uh, the fact that many bat houses that people put up get used, not all of them do, that uh, they're potentially filling a really useful need. Um, so I, I wish I could say, yes, we have a great you know, publication that shows, yeah, you put up 20 bat houses in your neighborhood and your bat population goes up and your pest insects go down. We definitely can't say that, um, but they do often get used. Uh, we know bats are successful raising pups in bat houses. They're also often very successful raising uh, pups in people's homes and attics, um, but obviously sometimes the people aren't so keen on on uh, on that uh, that sort of close proximity for sort of understandable reasons. Um, so I guess I'm not sure that's a totally satisfying answer. Um, I, w when in doubt, I advise people to put one up, but I also advise people not to be too disappointed if they don't get bats. Um, mm. The ones that tend to have the most success 
they tend to be close to a source of fresh drinking water. They tend to get a lot of sun. It's tough to get a bad house too hot just from the sun at our latitudes in the prairies. Um, they uh, need, they like it warm in the summertime. Um, you need the right design of bat box. And if you go to uh, our uh, bat watch website, just uh, batwatch.ca, there's some advice for how to find plants for bat houses there. Um, so good design, um, an open flyway. You don't want to put your bat house in the trees where there's a lot of obstacles that bats might have to uh, contend with. They like a nice open driveway to get in and out and that improves solar exposure. Um, and then uh, and then up high uh, and close to an existing colony. Great, thank you for that answer. I'm thinking about my backyard right now and <laughs> where I can put a bat box. <laughs> yeah, nice, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's another question here. Is white nose syndrome a problem for bats who use crevices in the ground and trees instead of caves? Like, Can white nose syndrome survive in those areas? That's a fantastic question. We don't have a solid answer to that question yet. Um, our hunch is, well, my hunch is that, um, yes, as we move to bats that are in rock crevices and they're in smaller groups, we still think they're abundant all throughout Western North America, but lots of individuals in relatively small crevices. <coughs> Excuse me. As far as we can tell, those crevices have similar conditions uh, as the caves where little brown bats hibernate. So once you go into, say, a crevice in a rock or um, uh, in, say, the, um, you know, well, small rock crevices, if they go back far enough, they're uh, cold but not freezing and really high humidity. And that's what the fungus needs to grow. So I expect it'll be able to grow in those kinds of sites. Um, how it will spread uh, among those kinds of sites is an open question, but we think a lot of the spread perhaps happens in the fall before hibernation at a time of year known as swarming. When bats gather at hibernation site, they fly around the entrance of the hibernation site and they mate promiscuously at that time of year. Um, that seems like a reasonable time when lots of this fungus is getting spread around. They're not really hibernating in the caves at that point, but they're probably going in and getting some on them. If they also do this at crevice roosts, then it could spread, I think, reasonably quickly, probably more slowly than it would in a cave with 100,000 bats in it. Um, but that, that spread, there's potential there, and I think the conditions could support it in rock crevices. In terms of trees, that's a different story, and uh, I, uh, I don't know. We have found it on the silver-haired bat. We have not found white nose syndrome. We've not found the like actual severe disease on silver-haired bats, but they have been found with the fungus on them, and so they can potentially spread it. We also know they occasionally go into bat houses that are also used by little brown bats. So there could be some cross-species transmission that way. My hunch is that those species tolerate conditions in trees that are maybe too dry. They're also probably not hibernating for long enough, months and months. It takes almost three months to get to the point where the fungus is, is killing a bat because the fungus grows so slowly. Uh, and our migratory tree roosting bats probably go far enough south where they might have to go into torpor for a few weeks, but then they'd get a nice evening where they can come out and forage a bit, and then they'll go cold for another two weeks and then get a nice warm front. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there are some differences across species and in, across habitats for sure. Thank you for that answer. That looks like all the questions that we have right now. So I just really want to thank you for for the awesome presentation today. It was so informative and, and your passion and your enthusiasm for bats is, is pretty contagious. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Caitlin, and thanks everyone for the great questions. And to all of our listeners out there, um, a recording of this webinar will be posted on the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. So you're welcome to, to check that out and rewatch it if you're looking for more information. Um, and then I would just like to encourage everyone to check out the PCAP website, www.pcap-sk.org, for information about upcoming events. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.